that a pandemic was imminent, um, most likely influenza, but it could be something else like Ebola. But the fact that it's Corona doesn't in any way change the message that's been broadcast in official reports and even in Hollywood films for the last 15 years. Now, just before President Trump was inaugurated in 2017, just a week before, the outgoing public health officials in the Obama administration and in the incoming Trump Homeland Security officials did a very large simulation of what would happen if a pandemic broke out in the United States. And it basically showed that there would be a system collapse. There weren't sufficient supplies. Local leaders uh, had not been educated into the kind of measures that would be needed. So despite 15 years of warnings in the existence even of the national uh, pandemic plan, this exercise showed that uh, we're totally unprepared. The administration's, the new administration's reaction to this was to propose large cutbacks in center, the Center for Disease Control, which of course is the agency uh, responsible uh, for detecting and organizing responses to emerging diseases. Uh, Trump administration then went on to dissolve, in fact, fire the entire staff of a pandemic working group that had been set up uh, in the administration. It's the same time, of course, that Trump was cutting back and trying to repeal uh, Obamacare in the United States. Can you see me, hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? We can hear you. Sir. We can hear Okay, let me continue then. At the same time, on a global scale, the World Health Organization has had a set of guidelines, actually rules, a convention that was signed by most countries, including the United States, which of course generally avoids uh, international cooperation these days. And it outlined measures to be taken and above all emphasized the importance of cooperation, sharing resources. It also advised that air travel uh, be preserved uh, at least for medical personnel and experts. And what happened when the outbreak in the end of January and early February began to become a public emergency in Europe and the United States is that everybody, all the rich countries uh, ignored the protocols of this uh, convention and it became each man for himself. And what we're seeing, seeing right now, of course, is the meltdown of the institutions that were supposed to organize and uh, coordinate the, the sharing of resources and scientific information. So look to Europe. And as Italy became the hot spot and the death toll started soaring in Italy, what was the response of its sisters in the European uh, Union? Well, they shut their borders. They hoarded supplies and prevented the export of, of uh, equipment desperately needed by the Italians. So we end up in a situation today where the Chinese 
are now rushing to uh, Italy's aid in the absence of any serious EU response, coordinated, uh, you know, response. Now this mirrors the fragmented and nationalistic way that Europe had reacted to the refugee crisis uh, over the past five or six years. So one has to ask the question, what is Europe now? Is the European dream dead? It would almost seem so. Meanwhile, back at the World Health Organization, with nations refusing to comply with the guidelines that have been set down, the strategy that has been adopted by the WHO, the WHO has become virtually powerless or certainly marginalized in the current crisis. And finally, let me return to my own country, which has now promised to provide 320 some million dollars in aid to 62 different countries. Okay, divide 320 million by six, uh, 62. Uh, this is absolutely ridiculous, but it's only a matter of the Trump administration's totally inwardly focused American first ideology, but it extends across the whole spectrum of American politics. During the Democratic primary debates in this country, neither Bernie Sanders, who my family uh, zealously supports, nor Elizabeth Warren ever talk once about world poverty, or for that matter, much about the world uh, at all. And I've been arguing kind of nonstop for the last couple of weeks that the American left, now hugely enlarged because of the Sanders campaign and, and the grassroots activity of thousands of people, that we're very close to our own version of, of American first. In the Communist Manifesto, of course, our founders wrote that the communists differ from the mainstream of the workers' movement in two respects only. In struggles of the present, they represent the needs of the future. And in national movements or local movements, they represent the international working class as a whole. And American left is in many ways uh, uh, has failed to meet that second responsibility uh, at all. And to, right now, we should be advocating for major aid package for, for Africa and other poorer countries as we ramp up production of medical supplies and test kits and ventilators. We keep ramping that up far beyond our own domestic need, which right now is gigantic, in order to produce a surplus that can be shared with other countries. Now, the most immediate crisis in terms of international aid and solidarity is with our sister country south of the border. I live with an eyesight of Tijuana. We live right on the border. Uh, my wife is Mexican. We have a large Mexican family. And the Mexican response has been very hard to believe. I mean, it's really been incredible. Uh, Obrador, the president of Mexico, ran as a left populist and was supported by uh, progressives everywhere. We were very excited when he was elected. But his reaction to the pandemic, very similar to Bolsonaro, the neo-fascist um, in power in Brazil, has been absolute denialism. Uh, he's appeared at public rallies. He's encouraged mass events up until recently. Uh, 
one of his allies, uh, the governor of a northern Mexican state, has declared that this disease only affects the rich, not the poor, uh, which of course is the, you know, the reverse of what's actually uh, happening. And now along the border, you can see panic on the other side because people have been left to deal with this uh, on their own. And the likelihood is that Mexico will wake up in the next few days and find the coronavirus uh, rampant everywhere. The border's been shut because the pandemic is a perfect opportunity for Trump to press forward with his wall building and exclusion of, uh, uh, of migrants. Half of my wife's family lives on the other side. We can't get anything to them in terms of aid. Uh, so this is a fundamental test of internationalism that's going on. And I think that out of this, we could create a whole network, <clears throat> pardon me, of <clears throat> linkages between movements in different countries. But what we have to do, I think, is out of an, whatever kind of international discussion we can possibly have, is join together around a common platform for action and demands that we make to ensure that a very large part of humanity uh, is, is not simply sacrificed to the greed of rich countries and the incapacity of capitalist regimes to react rationally and comprehensively to the crisis. Now, I have see another question here about the relationship between the, the global north uh, and the south and uh, why these diseases emerged in, in the south. Uh, there are kind of three main factors here. In terms of influenza, influenza originates in southern China or adjacent countries. And that's because China, southern China, for almost two millennia, maybe more, has had the most successful agricultural system on earth. Uh, two rice crops, domestic birds, ducks, uh, uh, chickens, uh, raised on the, uh, uh, the patties, pigs, and this is assured production of both protein and carbohydrates that allowed for, particularly in the uh, 18th century, for a vast increase in, in population. But it also is the perfect crucible for the incubation and spread of disease of influenza. The reason being that influenza is resident in a, in a, in a mild form in wild birds. Wild birds uh, interact with domestic birds, ducks in the patties. Pigs are both a, have both a, a similar immune system to humans, but they can be affected both by human influenzas and by avian influences. So what happens inside pigs is if a pig cell has an infection by an avian and a human or human related influenza, it, produce, it can produce a hybrid, a recombinant, which has genes from both the wild birds, which are, uh, our immune systems have no experience with and are absolutely lethal 
Plus, from the human side, it possesses the keys to attach and then in, invade human cells. And this is how pandemics uh, arise. The, the second factor is that everywhere in East Asia and Southern Asia, but especially in China, the barriers are being broken down between wild populations of, of, of bats and other animals and, and humans. The case of Ebola and other diseases in West Africa is particularly interesting because it demonstrates the direct role of multinational capital in incubating uh, outbreaks. In a nutshell, what's happened in the Gulf of Guinea in the seas off of West Africa over the last 30 years has been an invasion of, uh, of the fishing grounds by factory fleets from Europe and Russia. Traditionally, West Africans have gotten their protein in the form of fish, but local fishermen have been totally unable to compete with these factory uh, fleets. Scientists estimate that half the biomass of the Gulf of Guinea was uh, depleted by the uh, corporate fishing fleets, which created a protein shortage in West Africa because the price of fish then uh, greatly increased. Now, at the same time, multinational logging firms in Gabon and Cameroons, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, discovered that they could lower the labor costs if they hired a couple of professional hunters for each operation and basically kill anything in sight that they considered edible. And 70 different species of, of animals ended up on the plate of the men working in, in the logging camps. As the protein deficiency grew more extreme and West Africa, urban people started turning to what was called bush meat. And that provided, or, or uh, created the, the transmission belt between wild species in the forest, the pristine forest that were being logged out and, uh, and the cities. The third thing, and, and uh, the last point I want to make about this, is that neoliberalism is nowhere more uh, real than in the global disinvestment in public health. During the period, the, the 50s and early 60s, the age of Nehru, Sakarno, uh, Nasser, the Algerian revolution, there were real substantial gains in public health. But of course, by the 1970s, the promises of national revolutions begin to become barren for a variety of reasons. But then in the end of the 70s and through the 80s and early 90s, we had the debt crisis across the global south, structural adjustment programs, which mandated the reduction of public budgets and public services, as well as encouraged privatization of public agencies, uh, was a disaster for public health in so, so many, many countries. And these cutbacks have continued. And of course, they're not confined simply to the South. They occur in the North, uh, most dramatically in the cases of Great Britain and the crisis that's amid, uh, arisen in the national health system is the 
Tories have repeatedly cut its budget and reduced it in some ways to a shadow of the efficient and in my experience, quite wonderful public health system it once was. I lived in Northern Ireland and uh, England for almost a, a decade. It was amazing for Americans to watch walk into a medical clinic in London or in Belfast and no bills, tiny copay for prescriptions, no bureaucracy. Well, uh, much has changed and all for the worse. And in the United States, since the election of Ronald Reagan, we've had annually increasing attrition of public health resources and access to uh, particularly to hospitals. Uh, in the age of Reagan, 20% of the hospital beds in the United States were lost as the private health maintenance organizations and private hospitals in general went to a kind of just-in-time inventory system. They wanted the highest capacity and use of beds, uh, preferably around 90%. So they eliminated uh, beds that were regularly filled. That is, they eliminated the ability of hospitals to deal with surges so that of cases. So even in recent influenza years, bad influenza years, this overwhelmed the American hospital system. And then there have been the continual cutbacks in public health agencies and the increasing numbers in, in many states of people without health care. This was changed or reformed to some degree by the Obama administration, but it still left uh, tens of millions of Americans uh, without any kind of uh, medical insurance or access to health care. Uh, people who weren't insured have only one option, and that's to go to a public hospital where the average wait in the emergency room is six to eight hours across the, uh, across the country. So neoliberalism has been a disaster for public health everywhere. At the very same time, that corporate internationalism is everywhere removing boundaries and barriers between animal populations, animal diseases, and humans. I'll take another question. Okay, let me, how do we imagine? Well, look, Well, we say the transmission rates will decrease, but you have to recall what happened in your country in 1918, 1919, where forced exports of grains, the requisition of grains by the Indian armies in the field of the Middle East, East Africa, combined with drought, put tens of millions of uh, your country, fellow country people uh, in a state of near famine, or in some cases, you know, directly in famine, so that when the so-called Spanish flu reached India, Western India, and encountered the bodies of poor people uh, who were malnourished, or maybe just recovering from, I think there was a cholera epidemic at the same time. It just sighed down. It, it just, you know, uh, destroyed people 
who were in, in poor health. And it probably changed the nature, reshaped the nature of the infection itself. Now, in the case of coronavirus, most of the research on coronaviruses up to the SARS epidemic was confined to animals. And the reason was that there are two SARS viruses that produce the common cold, about 10 to 30% of colds are coronaviruses. But coronaviruses have been very lethal in uh, animal populations, particularly pigs. And so there's a lot of research about that. And, and what was discovered by veterinary science was that these corona infections took two forms. The milder form was the respiratory or pulmonary infections, but there were also gastrointestinal infections. And these were uh, absolutely uh, deadly. It produced huge uh, losses and uh, uh, domestic pig uh, uh, populations. Now, since the outbreak of coronavirus, and particularly in the studies done on the cruise ships, where often uh, a majority of crew and passengers were uh, infected, tested positive, is that there's a minority of cases where it seems that coronavirus uh, COVID has, has taken the fecal oral route of transmission and become a gastrointestinal disease, first of all. And why is that worrisome? Well, given that such a large minority of the human race lacks access to clean water or sanitation, and because the virus is shed in human feces, it opens up a kind of second front in the pandemic. And there are four or five articles out there right now uh, discussing that because it also raises the possibility that as COVID spreads through Africa and the slums of South Asia, it could acquire a more lethal character and the kind of unusual age uh, or demographic uh, privilege that people under 50 uh, enjoy right now from uh, lethal cases, fatal cases of coronavirus. Well, that could change when you're dealing with young people with suppressed or partially suppressed immune systems in sub-Saharan Africa. There are 24 million cases, identified cases still of HIV AIDS. There are millions of people uh, with tuberculosis. So these more sickly populations, or populations with greater percentage of pre-existing conditions are not only more vulnerable to it, but they could actually reshape the epidemic, which of course will circulate back and forth across the world in a succession of waves for the next 18 months or so. And the idea that these waves of reinfection will be increasingly less lethal and milder well, it may be, in fact, the opposite that occurs. And the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, it broke out first in the spring. And by the way, the Spanish flu is a misnomer. First identified cases were in Kansas at army training camps. Probably should call it the Kansas flu. But of course, at that time, everybody was, you know, claiming, oh, no, it's the, uh, uh, the Russian flu, or they were blaming it on gypsies or in uh, Russia, they were blaming it on the Cossacks for some uh, some reason. But this first outbreak in the spring was more lethal than the routine influences that occur every year. But it 
only was a, a, a brief epidemic. And then it kind of went into hiding to reappear in the summer of 1918, uh, particularly in August. And it began uh, killing people in the United States and Western Europe in increasingly large numbers. And it also became a decisive factor in the uh, defeat of Germany because as the Germans launched their great final offensive in 1918, uh, they had a quarter million German troops died of, uh, uh, of the Spanish flu. And at the same time, hordes of Americans were arriving every day in Brest to uh, make up for the, the sick or dying uh, Allied soldiers. Uh, people say that, including the president of the United States, has said, well, in warmer weather, it will disappear. But the second outbreak, far more deadly outbreak, of course, occurred in warm weather, uh, hot weather around the earth. So the experience of 1918, 1919 is vital to understand. There are, of course, some differences between coronaviruses and influenza, but the fundamental lessons of 1918, 1919, uh, which are often misunderstood, is that infections, pandemics evolve, and they evolve with the greatest rapidity in areas where people uh, are unhealthy or in conjunction with other diseases. Persia, Iran in 1918, 1919, all of Southern Persia was occupied by the British and the British Indian uh, army. It had the same problem of requisition of grains. But above all, it had had a very serious outbreak of malaria, uh, just a huge spike in malaria cases. And malaria interacted with the Spanish flu to kill 20% of the population of Persia. Okay, uh, about big pharma. Well, Big Pharma, of course, uh, advertises itself as the absolute safeguard of our health because it develops all the new medicines we need. Uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, Big Pharma has abdicated the development of anti new antibiotics and antivirals because they're really not uh, very profitable at all. Uh, you may develop it, uh, say they were rapidly developing a vaccine for SARS in 2003, but when the epidemic subsided, they stopped doing it because why do you develop something uh, which doesn't have a large market or disease that uh, may go into uh, uh, seclusion for years before uh, it reappears. It's been possible to develop, for instance, a universal vaccine for influenza that uh, attacks the stable parts of the surface, surface proteins of influenza virus. Uh, uh, the vaccinations we have now uh, affect the variable parts, the, the ends of these uh, mega proteins on, on the surface and have to be adjusted every year. But a universal vaccine uh, is by consensus of the research community, easily within reach, but it's never been a priority to governments. And it's something that big pharma doesn't doesn't see any profit in doing. I mean, it's like if General Motors engineers told the corporate leaders that, look, here's a car we can build. It will last forever. Needs hardly any maintenance. Uh, 
provides safety. It's an electric vehicle. Took that to the Board of General Motors. Would they decide, in a sense, to put themselves out of business by producing a car that could last for 50 years? No, not at all. And that's the case with big pharma and essential medicines. It's simply more profitable to produce medicines that uh, help uh, elderly males uh, deal with uh, sexual dysfunction than it is with uh, antibiotics. Big Pharma devotes a much larger budget to advertising than it does to research and development. And in fact, most of the new uh, drugs, wonder drugs, are actually developed by smaller uh, companies, often offshoots of university research that use research in the public sector to develop products and then Big Pharma will uh, buy them out or acquire the, uh, uh, the patent. So in essence, the global pharmaceutical monopoly or ugly legal P, I'm never able to pronounce that word correctly. Um, they're almost a form of rentier capitalism. Okay by their control of, of, of drug patents and by their ability to uh, basically scoop up uh, the products of, uh, of companies and, and public universities that uh, are the most dynamic in developing new medicines. Um, they acquire, they live by uh, uh, rents. Their essential social function, as they depict it, in fact, heart doesn't really exist. And one place where big pharma, um, I mean, big pharma is, is also, of course, an enormous political lobby. And the one place where this has uh, produced some of the worst effects is its relationship with the World Health Organization. 15 years ago, I went to Geneva when I was writing this book of mine on avian flu and talked to the World Health Organization. At that point, India, your country, was demanding generic production of an antiviral that had proven very successful in dealing with new strains of uh, influenza. And we're calling upon the WHO to take leadership in ensuring that lifeline medicines were, you know, uh, uh, could be produced, you know, cheaply and, and in mass. But what the WHO did is this particular drug, I think, was antiviral, was produced by Roche, uh, which I believe is also based, I don't know, in Geneva, but they're in Zurich or somewhere, uh, a Swiss firm. And instead of crusading for generic production, they cut a deal with Roche, where Roche would give them basically an emergency stockpile, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of doses. Uh, in return, the WHO would lay off calling for uh, public production uh, outside the patents. Of, of the antiviral. So the WHO in some ways is like a, an American regulatory agency. And in American history, regulatory agencies have been set up to control uh, industries have ended up being captured by the very industries they're designed to regulate. And I think this is to some, day, uh, some degree true of, um, of the WHO, unfortunately. So on one hand, the WHO has these internal contradictions. It's reliance on uh, Big Pharma or the Gates Foundation, uh, which has tremendous influence now in the WHO. And on American governments. The director general of the WHO came out a few weeks ago in praise of President Trump and the fabulous job he was doing uh, 
confronting the epidemic. Other questions? I should probably tell you, by the way, that President Trump is more popular than ever right now. His general approval ratings are back at the maximum they were uh, after his inauguration, low by historical standards. But the base of the Republican Party remains absolutely, uh, you know, zealously uh, supportive of the president. But amongst voters as a whole, ask the question, has the president done a good job in handling the pandemic? 60% of people say yes. And forces those of us who at least five times a day on CNN or in those of us who still read newspapers, you know, some new kind of misinformation spread by the White House is total failure to force companies to uh, produce uh, lifeline uh, uh, supplies. This seems incredible. He's totally fumbled it. Uh, he's going to be responsible for thousands of deaths. But in the enclosed worlds of, of, of Fox News and the information uh, that's only about the only kind of information and news that's available in large parts of the country. He's emerging as a hero. And he does have an adept capacity or ability uh, to turn this all into a reality TV show. And by making claims, which are the opposite of the reality on the ground, or his own deceptions in in lives, he succeeds in giving the impression uh, that he's leading uh, the fight back against the disease because he's failed to call for, uh, initially to call for production of more ventilators. Uh, in, in fact, he, he did an extraordinary thing. He told, well, this is really a matter for the states. Let the states work this out for themselves, which pitted all 50 states against each other in a race to try and find whatever supplies of ventilators, respirators were, were lost. And then yesterday, he announces that really this is all the fault of General Motors. They should be producing uh, this. So the ventilator shortage, which he created in, and, uh, uh, in the first place, by not in the very early days of, of, of this using federal power uh, to command uh, production of, of these ventilators. He's now been able to displace it uh, onto poor old General Motors. Uh, so this is, uh, this is kind of harrowing for those of us who thought that right-wing governments in Washington or Brasilia or, or London would uh, be hoisted on their own petards by their failures to respond adequately to the epidemic. Rapid urbanization. Um, I must confess I read with disbelief this morning uh, about your prime minister's uh, uh, shutdown and this order that people can't go out of their houses. Now, social distancing, of course, works well in, say, the United States in the suburbs where people live in single family uh, uh, homes where it's possible to uh, effectively practice uh, this. But when you get into crowded major cities like New York, uh, social distancing is very difficult to implement uh, successfully, but it's 
a problem of an entirely different order in, well, in this country, in nursing homes and in jails and prisons, but in the world's slums where sanitation is non-existent or effectively rationed, where people live back together like the uh, sardines in the densest uh, uh, slum neighborhoods. I mean, this is the perfect storm. They, it, you know, it's ludicrous to expect people uh, to stay in their homes and in, in slums, uh, particularly when you've had four hours uh, warning of the, uh, of the lockdown. And right now, the coronavirus, of course, is igniting huge outbreaks in places like Gaza, in Kibera, uh, the huge mega, one million population mega slum of uh, uh, Nairobi, Kinshasa, Libreville, every, uh, everywhere. Uh, I read today that. Uh, uh, it's now appeared in Burma. Uh, so the real massacre of humanity by this virus is only be, began. I mean, what you've seen in the wealthier countries in Europe and Italy, now New York City, uh, are just a prelude uh, to what we can expect. And that's why it's so incredibly important that the left around the world raise their voices to the highest pitch possible in demanding aid. Although at this point, and in the absence of a vaccine, uh, there's very little that can be done in, uh, you know, in the short term. Yes, I mean, this pandemic is a bit like, a, I mean, governments call it a war. Trump boasts that he's a wartime president. And of course, this war rhetoric is very dangerous, uh, precisely because uh, it becomes an excuse for appropriating uh, even more authoritarian powers and extending uh, the surveillance state. But it's also a terrain of, of, of struggle. And amongst the allied nations in the First World War and then in the Second World War, in order to keep public support for these slaughters, uh, Britain, the United States, uh, France, other countries, in fact, had to make concessions to unions, for instance, uh, that. Uh, allowed unions to uh, extend their contracts, include more workers in return for the unions disciplining workers and the munition and aircraft plants and, uh, and so on. Uh, they're forced to implement measures that were collectivist and sometimes almost uh, uh, socialist. Lenin, of course, wrote about this as uh, uh, state capitalism, wartime state capitalism, which he thought was a kind of antechamber to uh, a revolution uh, in Germany. But faced with the incineration of, of their profits and uh, the anger of uh, the middle classes uh, who, ex as they experience, uh, uh, the fatalities of, of this pandemic, even in the United States, uh, certain measures have been taken that would, would otherwise have been considered far too radical or extreme, like income maintenance for a couple of months, uh, money directly into uh, people's bank accounts, or the use of a wartime measure, the Defense Production Act. Uh, which very reluctantly uh, Trump is beginning to, to implement. These collectivist measures are in some sense beachheads. Uh, 
And nothing could be a stronger argument than for universal medical coverage for uh, a national health system than the pandemic right now. But of course, the other side is formulating its its own strategy, restructuring its own uh, uh, response. And kind of two things are happening. One is that companies that have become vital to survival in the pandemic, like Amazon, uh, have enormous profit opportunities uh, here. Uh, plus, they also have insider information. It was revealed today that Jeff Bezos, uh, the head of Amazon, uh, sold $3 billion worth of, uh, uh, of stock ahead of everybody else because he, of course, had the, the best sort of intelligence about the economic effects of this. He's probably the world's biggest war profiteer uh, right now. But as the pandemic becomes an extinction event for tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of small businesses in this country, uh, Amazon becomes a, a super monopoly, even more of a monopoly uh, over retail business than it is already. On the other side, everywhere, authoritarian governments uh, are imposing states of emergency and appropriating emergency powers. And of course, the record of the war on terror, what happened after 9-11, was that states of emergencies are, in fact, never really lifted. Emergency laws uh, stay on the books uh, as they have now for uh, 19 years since uh, uh, 9-11. So we have here an example of where on the side of, of capital, the authoritarian impulse and the profit impulse coincide, uh, trying to refashion the pandemic to bolster the position of, of, of the companies, the, the corporations, that have a kind of privileged uh, opportunity in the crisis. On the other side, there are opportunities, uh, you know, for the left. And again, nothing makes the case for universal coverage more than uh, the pandemic right now. Yes, philanthropy. Well, this has been happening in the United States. I mean, Trump has resisted to the very last moment. Uh, coercion against uh, 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 corporations. Uh, he's left it up to the market, the same kind of laissez-faire uh, politics that in the 19th century were responsible for the decimation of the Irish and of Indians and other uh, uh, colonial people. Uh, Great Britain's an even more extreme case uh, although there's some poetic justice going on now that uh, Boris Johnson and other members of his cabinet have uh, tested positive. Philanthropies, well, at least in this country, actually, uh, philanthropic uh, giving uh, has decreased markedly uh, in, the, in the Trump era. Uh, and in the several cases where, in fact, you have very large scale uh, private interventions in behalf of uh, public health, like the Gates Foundation. Uh, I mean, Gates, Bill Gates can walk into the WHO in, uh, in Geneva or into the White House. Uh, he, in many respects, has a louder and more important voice than do medical researchers as a community or our leading epidemiologists. Uh, I'm glad he's devoted part of his immense fortune to 
fighting malaria and, and other diseases. But he also provides cover. He provides an excuse for government's failures. Uh, American research and aid uh, for malaria. Don't worry about passing legislation. The Gates Foundation has nailed that. They're taking, uh, taking care of it. In fact, the capacity of philanthropy to produce meaningful action on any of the disease fronts is incredibly small. And governments, of course, use this to hide, hide behind this. Uh, I think that what we should be talking about instead of philanthropy is the nationalization and socialization of big pharma and a complete remodeling of budgets that national budgets and regional budgets uh, that give priority to multinationals or to def uh, military spending or to uh, padding the nest of, of uh, uh, politicians. Um, I make a distinction. I gave a talk to uh, on Jacobin, this new uh, uh, Zoom site. Uh, Jacobin, of course, uh, being the most popular American left journal right now. And I said we have to distinguish between two kinds of demands: a Rooseveltian demand in the for instance, uh, uh, in the farthest left movement of the Democratic Party that occurred during the Second World War, where Franklin Roosevelt called for an economic bill of rights, the second bill of rights for Americans, he was basically echoing what was going on in England, the Beveridge Report and uh, the Labor Party's demands for uh, national health service, uh, full employment, et cetera. Well, the Rooseveltian response right now would probably be, um, and I actually advocated this in an article of coming out, an excess profits tax, which occurred in uh, the two great world wars of the, uh, of the last century. Corporate profits were capped at 7%. Uh, Roosevelt even managed for six months uh, to impose a, a ceiling on wealth. Uh, anything about $25,000 in income was taxed away, 100% uh, wealth tax. So this falls within this kind of demand, which might seem very radical, actually falls within the, the historical scope of uh, American liberalism or European social democracy. But the socialist demand, that is why in this country say that we are supporting an excess profits tax and totally supporting uh, the demands made by Bernie Sanders' campaign. But what are the socialist demands? Uh, I call them Debs hand because Eugene Debs was the famous leader of the American socialist movement. What would Debs and the old Socialist Party be advocating under these conditions? Well, they would be advocating public production of medicines, breaking up the uh, big farmers. Um, and though I call that a socialist demand, it certainly is in the um, US because it's to the left of, uh, of Sanders. But Ireland just nationalized all of its hospitals. Uh, it's kind of an extraordinary thing to do. Uh, what we should have done during the uh, 2008 crisis, nationalized the, uh, you know, the banking systems. So in a sense, I believe that the, the left across the world has to fight for um, these two different uh, kinds of demands. On one hand, supporting a kind of popular front uh, for uh, the immediate crisis, but at the same time, 
uh, advocating and fighting as hard as we can for uh, uh, demands that are uh, basically on the road to social ownership of large scale uh, means of production. I am cut off. Uh, I, I've been battling cancer for three years. I've been very sick. So I've been kind of cut off from the activist world I've spent most of my life in. And uh, I'm uh, very clueless as to what people are doing elsewhere. I'm not not sure. I, I'm desperate to uh, to know about this, and I've gotten uh, the two leading, two of the three leading left-wing publishing houses in, in the U.S. Haymarket Books and Verso Books. I've been associated with Verso Books for 40 years. Uh, uh, are setting up a website that will debut uh, on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, it's called the Plague Year bulletin board so that uh, people can post uh, important examples of uh, responses from the left where they can post uh, news and commentary about the politics and political economy uh, of the crisis. Uh, being an old guy, is still marooned in the 20th century. I have, I have great difficulty navigating the web to uh, to, to find news. Uh, uh, the uh, what's your uh, what is it called? The uh, Political and Economic Weekly in India. Yeah, I used to read that zealously because uh, uh, I'm retired now. But when when I was teaching the library, actually had it and I'd go down there and read it uh, cover for cover. It's kind of, it's a very archaic, but at the same time, totally wonderful uh, combination of uh, theory and news and, you know, pop, uh, popular writing. I, I don't know if uh, your collective uh, uh, isn't aligned politically with its editorship, but certainly for an American reader, an overseas reader, it's a kind of one stop to find out uh, all kinds of things, uh, combination of academic journal and, uh, in the newspaper. But right now it is just uh, very, very chaotic. And uh, I know so many people are just spending most of their time trying to search for news, trying to find out well, what's happening in South Africa. What's, uh, what is the Spanish left? Uh, proposing to do? Uh, how about the Italians? What's going on in in, uh, in Brazil with this fascist uh, Bolsonaro? Uh, so we all need to make efforts and encourage other efforts uh, to establish, uh, you know, sources for broad informational uh, sources on the left. and. Uh, Obviously, you're doing your part in this right now. Thank you, Professor Davis, for joining us today. I think uh, we should end today's discussion on this note, uh, and hopeful note, on and have more discussions like this, uh, which will inform our actions wherever we are in different parts of the world. And hopefully, this crisis that uh, is on a world scale, um, we will be able to come up with a collective response to that with these sense of solidarity is being built up. Uh, so from Collective, I would like to thank Professor Davis for uh, your time and uh, sticking uh, with us despite all the technical glitches so far. And uh, uh, for all the listeners tuning in, uh, please do join more discussions that we will be having in the coming days as we're all staying isolated, but uh, extending solidarity with each other even in these testing times. Thank you. Okay. All, all power to you. Goodbye.